listen to it, but why would I say that one? That was cute. Stuff in the face. That's Christmas. I think up at my mother's. No, that was at our house in Virginia, I think. Peter liked to handle Christmas and handing everything out and be the big boss. Maria's birthday. And he was very paternalistic towards Maria. So he was always very solicitous. <laughs> Peter loved skiing. He always loved the mountains. Always loved Santa Fe. He all did. It was so much fun to see these home movies of the kids growing up. I haven't seen them for so many years. And it really makes me realize how much we miss Peter. sometimes, and uh, was very worried about her. I was also very, very sad for Peter. A grandmother feels it twice. She feels the sorrow of her child, and she feels the sorrow of her losing her grandchild. And I realized this was happening to me. Well, here's her 28-year-old grandchild, her first grandchild facing a... Um, terminal illness and um, she's 80, she's at the end of her life and this doesn't seem fair or natural um, for Peter's brothers and sisters sister it's very difficult, it leaves a, a large gap in the order that they've been used to all these years the first Christmas after he was gone was really hard <laughs> I thought we kept on waiting for Peter to get there he never arrived as I was growing up, Peter was the uh, was the kid in the family who was the, the voyage or the explorer or brought new territory. Well, I think a lot of siblings tend to look at their older brother and sister and say, I want to be that way. And Peter was never an athletic kid or anything, but he was very active and always sort of seemed to be the invincible one. And um, I think losing his health was, was devastating. It wasn't until I actually saw him that I realized how sad it was that this was my grandson. And I realized that here was this young man, suddenly grown old. It just shakes you from the inside out when you see it and you're there. The particular virus that really killed Peter was a cytomegalovirus, which is part of the herpes family. Um, and it's very common in AIDS patients. There's different effects with him. They think it caused the dementia and the hallucinating, the blindness, because he finally lost the sight in two eyes. Um, it caused his final pneumonia. It probably caused the extreme diarrhea that he had. He would get very frustrated with his poor coordination. Um, aging. People who only knew Peter in San Diego you see pictures of him taken three or four years before, you know, can't believe it's the same person. I didn't feel particularly upset and shocked and so on that Peter was gay. And I told him what I really did feel, which was that, number one, it wasn't a big surprise, but number two, that um, it did make me very sad for him because it's a very, very difficult way to live as a straight woman. I've heard plenty of people make their little gay jokes and so on and so forth, and I know that he was up for a lot of possible potential ridicule, discrimination, and so on and so forth. And um, you don't like to see your kids 
but their feelings hurt. I'd only known my two homosexuals ever before. I was real ignorant and, uh, and prejudiced. It wasn't until I had lost Lori that I went to the AIDS Project, and that was all homosexuals. And uh, it was an eye-opening experience. There are people, and there's good people and there's bad people. And homosexual doesn't make somebody bad. It's just their sexual orientation. It was real important for us to go on that walkathon as a family because we were involved in Lori's illness as a family. Hopefully, Sean and Coral's exposure has made them more sensitive to people and breaking down stereotypes and uh, resisting putting people in boxes. It all started like in November of 83, she got her first bout of pneumonia. And that was weird. It sort of came out of the blue. And then in June of 84, they tested her. And they said she probably would not last for that Christmas. So it was a real shock. It was really devastating, but she, you know, lasted almost another year. I just didn't want her to die. And I missed her and I love her. She always liked to play with play with me before she had blood transfusion. Because she's gone and I need that blood with her. As far as even like looking at having she was optimistic, look at this like Disneyland, can she go there someday too? I think the thing that uh, stands out more about Lori to me than anything is the fact that she was such an inspiration. She was 11 going on 50. And only having talked to other AIDS victims since her passing, have we completely understood what she was going through at the time. At night, she couldn't sleep because it was constant, hard, racking cough all the time. When it started affecting your brain, it was very hard to watch. And um, throwing up constantly, diarrhea all the time. She went down to 42 pounds, and really, she looked like a concentration camp survivor. I would have taken her back in any condition, and that's a terrible thing to say. You'd never want to wish her back as sick as she was, but I would have. Mm -hmm. This is this is a good picture of you and Tom. I like that one. I like that one. Your eyes are open. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I didn't know some of these were in there. Yeah, you haven't missed them for a long time. Huh? That one was his last last picture of It's the it's the missing. Yeah. Uh, it's the empty chair at, at, at holidays, and it's never going to be the same. Life isn't the same. Last year was harder. I knew he wasn't coming back at all, not that Christmas or the next one. A bit of my future went when he died. We knew Scott was gay from the time he was small. Uh, we didn't exactly have a handle on it, but we did know. In his parents sometimes know in their heart. I think he just came out and said, I, I wanted to tell you that I'm gay. It wasn't a surprise or a shock. I just thought, well, okay. You always you always wish that uh, that things would be different. But we were proud of him for the things he did. Scott was a very dynamic person. Uh, he was brilliant. A hundred times more brilliant than I am. He was emotional and enormously witty. He had uh, was a very strong, very independent, strong young man. And that's the sad part about the AIDS epidemic is that it, 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 it cuts down life at, at such a young age. I never had anyone close to me die. And to see someone who I was so close with die so horribly, so he was so thin and his, and his leavings and he was in such pain that uh, it's just the worst thing in the world. I never thought that he wasn't beautiful because he had lesions on his face. Now I know how awful that must have been for him to be marked on the outside 
as well as on the inside. Right towards the end, Scott woke up. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning, and Barbara said, We're here, Scott. Dad's here, too. And he said, He said, I love Dad. He said, I love Dad best of all. I'll never forget that minute. That, that meant more to me than, than a lifetime. It's really marvelous. Uh, I think the frustration of being a helpless bystander to this disease that's taking your child's life was probably the hardest thing as a parent. It's hard to know when to give up all hope because with AIDS, you sort of take one infection at a time, so it's a roller coaster ride. It's always up and down. And um, I think Ken's biggest fear during all his illness was making that wrong decision, calling it quick too soon. It was just really hard for him to let go, to finally say, no more IVs, no more transfusion. I think really that was the hardest time for him. That last day, she went in to Peter, and she said, to him, Peter, I'm here. This is this is mother, and you can go any time. It's important to tell them that they can go when it is time. And again, you have to know instinctually when to say this. It's very difficult. Um, and that it's all right to stop fighting. They don't have to hang on because it's you. And it wasn't very much long until after that that he died. And he died very peacefully. He just went to sleep. It's hard to believe that life could go on. It's funny, but I feel that in a way, any one of us in the family, if we could have given our own lives for him to live, we would have. And whenever I've heard that in the past in novels or something, you've always thought of it as not really they don't really feel that. You can't really feel that. But you can. I felt I had the most horrible death to, to go through because it was a death with a social stigma attached. Where any other disease that my child could have died of, I would have gotten instant and automatic health. My son got a virus. He's gone. No matter what he died of, he's not coming back. I think the hardest part was going to work and living the lie, being dishonest. I hated hiding that, hiding the fact, the true nature of his illness, lying about it, saying he just had cancer. I did have a job to protect. When Ross Hudson was diagnosed, I, I dreaded going to work. Every time people would talk or make a joke or start on a conversation that I didn't like, I'd run to the radio and turn it up. And I just felt like screaming out, you know what's happening, you know what's happening to me. And I can't be honest about it. That hurts so much and still does. The pain of not being able to be completely open and honest was like I was denying my own son's humanity. We went through that uncertainty, not knowing how people would I uh, react. There were a couple families, you know, one that was very close to us and uh, found out all the information we could give them and still said, we love you, but, and we support you, we just can't have our children around you, children. The case, of course, that comes to mind most vividly was the uh, time that the apricots from our tree were uh, rejected as a, as a gift just because they came from our apricot tree. It hurts. Even though you don't want it to hurt, it, it does. Hey, guys. It's time to eat. Yeah. John and Coral did feel a suggestion, and it was very hard for them to understand why the friends, certain friends, couldn't come around. Because I didn't want other people to know that she did have AIDS. Because they're afraid that they'll catch it. There was one person that who, um, they thought they thought I had AIDS, but I I didn't I I had I got a test and I and I really they kept, they kept teasing me about it. It's probably more dangerous for an AIDS patient to 
be in contact with other people uh, far more than it is for other people to be in contact with them. And our children are living testimony to the fact that you cannot get this disease casually. We were just as determined to make life at home as normal as we possibly could without isolating her further. Hugging was always there. It was there before Lori got the disease, and I got it was there after she got it, too. You were always really close. And we're all fine. And I think that's important that people know that. And it was important for Lori. I think if you guys would have felt, you know, if, if you didn't want to touch her and you didn't want to hug her, how do you think that would have made Lori feel? Very bad. It's so like nobody cared for her. No, she was up in the hospital. I can't believe any parent would turn their back on their child in sickness or in health. I, I can understand the not understanding. I cannot understand the hatred. It, it's beyond me. Um, a mother saying, I, I won't be there for you. I, I can't imagine it. It makes me sad, it makes me sick, it makes me very angry. It makes me very, very angry. Or any parent. Not, not just the mother, but the father too. And I think that's the worst. It's when the father turns it, denies his son, and turns away from him and disowns him. I, it's, it's just impossible to, to believe that there are people like that. But I know there are. Family support is crucial, or at least some good support system is crucial. In the case of, of Barbara and Peter, um, Peter's brothers and sisters came and helped a great deal. I can arrange for physical care, if necessary, in this hospital, but I can't provide the emotional support uh, in, in anything like the way a family can. And that's why I emphasize the importance of early involvement and, uh, and just a lot of time spent with the patient by the family before they're ill, while they can still enjoy the interaction, while old wounds can be mended and old problems solved. I noticed you were 104 when you came in, and now you're down to 101, roughly, so. It is uh, awful to watch people die alone. Peter's life would have been terrible if it hadn't been for, for Barbara and the rest of his family. It's the difference between having a peaceful death, having a sense of completion about your life, and dying with a lot of unfinished business. I remember one patient that um, Barbara felt very, very close to, who, whose parents and family rejected him completely. Um, we would call them on the phone and say, you know, your son needs you now. And after this man died, his mother was destroyed. She regretted not being there for her son. The issue of homosexuality has gotten so mixed up with this disease and was from the start that people have developed some very strange ideas and people who should know better. Um, an infectious disease is very likely to affect anybody that is infected and the homosexuality part of it of course has just to do with exposure to the virus. This disease doesn't care whether you're gay or straight, whether you're white or black. You know, it, it is an organism that is looking for a T helper cell to live in. It's also a very smart bug because it has learned to get transmitted through sexual intercourse, which is something that um, most human beings participate in at some time during their lives. And um, any, any disease that can get itself transmitted to sexual intercourse is going to be around for a long, long time. I think there have been people who uh, are so uncomfortable either with their own sexuality or with sexuality in general that this epidemic has become an excuse for them to, to refocus anger and hostility and anxiety on, on uh, homosexuality.
And I think our laws need to be to be fixed in such a way that homosexuality is made unlawful and that uh, people who have either the germ or, uh, or the disease are quarantined. I was on a debate on, on a local TV station about the school system, and on the other side was a school board member and then a pastor, Dorman Owen, who's a fundamentalist, and he says, do you represent the homosexual community? <laughs> And I says, no, I don't. And when we tried to debate this issue, he says, we need to get back to the main issue, which is homosexuality. And that's not the issue at all. A lot of people ask me, didn't I harbor a lot of anger and resentment against uh, the person or the homosexual community? Because that's another thing that this pastor said on the air. This lady, for instance, had a child that was infected. Uh, that child was infected from a homosexual. He doesn't know that, and I resent anybody that tries to tell me that they know that person was a homosexual, because they don't know that. But whoever it was, I don't feel anyone would go on purpose, knowing they have AIDS, and go and give their blood to somebody else to get it. And whoever it was is probably no better off than Lauren, so I can't really harbor any of that. If there's one thing that I have come away with um, as a, uh, a straight person viewing the problems of, the, of gay people, it is that uh, the need for openness at whatever the cost at the moment is, is really important. And I urge my patients, uh, if they've never come out to their family, to do so. It isn't always, it doesn't always work out well. And there are some parents who are so socialized that they can't get beyond all of that accumulated stuff that's poked into us about homosexuality. Um, to get to their child, to remember that this person is their own flesh and blood. And for those people, it's, it's a terrible, lonely time. The homosexual part seems to be more important than that their son is dying of AIDS, and I don't understand that in the least. <laughs> is a wonderful woman I've known over a year. Her son's lover had AIDS, and at the very end, Irene gave up her job temporarily, came down and took care of that boy because his family would have nothing to do with him at all, and moved into the house with the two young men and helped Paul take care of Greg all the way to the very end. It was quite frightening for he had no idea what AIDS was really like and how horrible it is. And, um, but she went right to it and took care of him and gave him all the love that his own mother should have given him all the time knowing that this time next year she could be doing the same for her own son. I worry about him. If he gets a sore throat, I worry. If he gets a cough, I worry. Um, I'm scared. Now that Greg has passed, passed away, I think about it now. And yeah, it, it does frighten me. Greg and I had a commitment to each other. I love Greg like I've loved no other person before. He was there in good times and in bad times. We were able to talk, um, discuss things, share things. And um, I loved him very much. And I always will. Greg asked me to get in touch with his mother, which I did. I wrote her a letter explaining to her that Greg was the same person that he was before she found out that he was gay. And it would be nice if she could just reach out and let him know that it was all right. She never did. There are a lot of kids who have no support at all, and it's just when the kid needs the most. And um, it's very tragic. I've known a lot of patients in that situation. During the course of Peter's illness, she had come in contact with enough other AIDS patients who had been neglected by their families or lost their jobs, and she hated that. It hurt her almost as much as it hurt her to see Peter die.
Barbara Peabody is like a surrogate mom to me. She's been a, a wonderful friend, and I could I could go on and on and on about Barbara. She's a mother figure, and myself, as well as a lot of other uh, people, don't have their mothers around now. She's hugged me and and let me be angry, and she's just accepted me for who I am. I don't know how she does it, but she's always there, and if you've heard her giggle or her laugh. Uh, you can understand why she can lift us up so easily. <laughs> oh, we no, I, I have. Be careful about that one. <laughs> God, what then, but, but I will say this, this heart class has a lower incidence of mortality than right. anything else. You know, it's, it's amazing how this <clears throat> painting is an escape. I feel better. Yeah. I was so sick this morning. It's given my life a meaning where if I didn't have that, every day would be just waiting to die. I've learned to put colors with my feelings. And having, having Barbara here, who is kind of like a quote-unquote mom, and, and knowing it's safe for me to fall apart here. The um, environment of the class um, can vary from minute to minute. <laughs> One minute they'll be joking and uh, telling dirty jokes or gossiping or whatever, and in the next 60 seconds talking about death and about what kind of funeral service they want. Johnny had thought it was the last, just the end of it. For so long, he's had about five different changes in his funeral please. plan. What's the latest music you want? There isn't any. I just want to play party at a disco and have for this. I always wanted to go out like a Vita. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful so like song. Nancy said, don't cry for me, California. <laughs> <laughs> I think we thought so small compared to the others. If there was a place in this picture that would describe how I feel today, it would be right here, this patch of blue. It's hemmed in by the green and the orange. There's no way out of it. For the woman oh, students I have yeah. in class, it's been very important. She has had a tendency, it's not uncommon with AIDS or art patients to stay cooped up in her house. So what's your feeling about all these colors and these fears or awful things and nightmares and that kind of stuff? I don't know. He's just a guy, person, standing alone. Mm -hmm. Alone in this great big world. Crazy. It looks like a frightening world. Like, kind of, just kind of lost, <laughs> like, what the fuck do I do now? <laughs> right. Glenn has, I think, probably a bottomless amount of sorrow and sadness in him, and he is trying to paint this. He's painted tears before. Well, I have a lot in common with Barbara because uh, my friend died about a year ago, and there's an anger that comes from the death of a loved one that has to be channeled somewhere. Some people uh, channel it inward and get more angry and uh, destructive. And people like Barbara turn it into a hope and a challenge. It is very hard after, you know, you lose your own child and then to keep working with these patients. Um, about six months after Peter had died, and I was still doing the art class with several of them, several of them started getting sicker and weaker, and, uh, but on the other hand, had been so stimulated by the art, and I wondered if this was really worth doing. I mean, if he's gonna die. And I thought, well, so what, even if they only do have three years, six months, or two years left, the important thing is that they are able to do this, and they can regain a bit of self-esteem and pride. We're all going to die sometime, and I do think we, each and every one of us, have a right to die with as much dignity as possible. I'll die, um, probably before they get a cure for this disease, but I don't sit around and wait for it. I think death is going to find me, and I'll probably be bone something, or painting, or something. I'm not ready to hang up my dancing shoes yet, even though the music stops. You know, I can keep dancing. I have a special relationship with them because of Peter, and it just feels really good to be able to do something for them.
Well, did you have any special theme or idea in mind? It's just called artist? outburst. It's like, you know, okay. I kind of like relating this to my anger. Okay. It's just been pure hell since August 13th with the three members of my family that uh, don't want anything to do with me. It hurts to know that I can't call my sister anymore, that we can't share any more fun times together. What does family mean anymore? I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't know when I'm going to die. And I don't want to die alone. When my aunt found out that my uh, partner had died of AIDS, she told my cousin that those people deserve what they get. They deserve to die. It was just real tragic for me to have a woman that I respected all my life have that kind of feeling for another human being. For people to sit back and say, you've got it because you're gay, which my father said to me, what a bigot. You know, I've sat back and I've looked at, at some of the AIDS patients go, like Jervy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he died a horrible death. Mm -hmm. That was just horrible. And I wonder, what's in store for me? Well, Jer one of Jervy's big problems was his mother. Yeah. Well, true. She used to call on the telephone and demand that he repent, repent in Jesus' name. And that he was this horrible sinner, and that's the reason he had this disease. And she finally browbeat him into repenting on his yeah. deathbed. Yeah. I don't know if she actually put into words that she couldn't love him unless he repented. And the big sin was being homosexual. And this boy was dying, you know, by the week he was getting worse. And she got there, I guess, about 24 hours before he died. Very often, um, it does turn out to be too little, too late. And um, it's just very, very tragic. Imagine how lonely Jerby felt. But oh, it's like, I don't know if I could go through the, it's the physical stuff that scares me. I need to know that that family support is there. If I was denied that from my mother, I don't feel I would be successful at fighting off the uh, infections or whatever that are in pursuit of my body. I did not have family support for uh, about a year and a half. Yeah. I just felt like, well, I'm just, you know, worthless. Uh, nobody cares. I'm sick. What should I live for? I would have felt terrible if my mother had not supported me in this. In the beginning, she found it, she approached it very disbelievingly. Um, back in 1983, the numbers of people were so small, it was like, this is impossible that this is happening. And she came around, um, thank God. I needed her very badly. My mother did write me a letter, and I, I didn't know how to respond to her because she hadn't been part of my life during my life, and I couldn't understand why she wanted to be part of my death. Actually, my family now is uh, all my friends that I met because of AIDS. I feel so much closer to my friends than to my family. Yeah, especially when I got real sick last week, I, I realized how, how horrible he felt every day. Yeah. And I thought, am I going to be just sick for six months? I, I just can't handle that. And um, I really understood how courageous he was mm -hmm. during that whole time. And he really was hanging on for me. He wasn't he was doing it for himself. Yeah. He was doing it for me. I wouldn't be able to handle it. It's like I already know that I have permission from Tom whenever the time comes. And it's made it a lot easier for me to deal with it and accept the, the inevitable thing it is. Tom and I have been together seven years. I happen to be gay, yes. But I did not live in the fast lane at all. I've lived in the slow lane all my life. And Tom has been the love of my life. Had I come down with this disease and not had him around, I probably would have lasted for about six months. I do love Johnny very much. And it's, unless a miracle happens, I'm going to lose him. And that hurts a lot. Right now, it's extremely difficult because I'm watching him deteriorate. It's very um, stressful on the both of them, but they have stuck together. And they will stick together no matter what happens in the future for John. Tom himself is um, HIV positive, so he can well have his own personal fears, but um, he's no coward. I couldn't, I couldn't leave him. There's no way. 
I've seen what's happened to other people when they were deserted by lovers or family, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers. It, it, it's just not right. I wish I didn't have to do all the, the nursing and whatnot. I wish we could go out and boogie a lot more. We could just go out and boogie once. It's going to be very, very lonely without him. But we're going to do our best not to let that happen. It's so isolating, and you feel like you're the only person in the world, or the only family in the world that is going through something like this, and nobody knows what you're going through. And and I found out that I wasn't, and that Barbara had to clean up the diarrhea <laughs> and the vomit and had to slowly see her child waste away. And we laughed and we cried for, for about three hours, and it was so wonderful to feel I wasn't alone. I first met Miriam Thompson through the um, San Diego AIDS Project, and about a month later, we started MAP, or Mothers of AIDS Patients. It was aimed primarily at mothers, called mothers, because the mother is the one that usually is most intimately involved with the care of the patient. We definitely do encourage fathers, though, if they want to contact with us, and also brothers and sisters. We formed it because we didn't want anybody else or any other family to go through what we had gone through alone. You had to be a, a Pollyanna, but some of the phone calls and letters make you feel that you really had it easy. Dear Barbara, my inner mourning surfaces with unbelievable pain, unfathomable rage, and now fear of what is to come. The reality, the awful reality, has taken my hope away. I am not. Sure. I think families are the um, the quiet sufferers in this epidemic. There are very little support services for families of AIDS and art patients, and they are really desperately needed. You take care and be happy, love, Fran. After Scott died, um, I used to read the obituaries in the local newspaper and also in the LA Times and um, study them and figure out how old this young man would be, would have been. And um, you know, I longed to call that family up and say, did your son happen to die of age? Would you like to talk about it? Would you like to talk with me? I couldn't have done it by myself. And I heard quite by accident that there was a MAP group in San Diego started by a woman named Barbara Peabody. And so I patterned a, a Los Angeles group after her group. It is the most devastating thing in the world. I lost my son, Greg, on September 11th of 84. And uh, I'll never get over that. It was my only child. and. Uh, when you lose your parents, you lose your past. When you lose a child, you lose your future. I feel that when a child dies, and believe me, when your son weighs 80 pounds, and you are taking care of him until the last breath, he is your child. He's a baby. It violates the order of the universe. My son was six foot three, and he weighed 85 pounds when he died. And he was a, a model in New York. Good looking, strong and all that. And then just to waste down to nothing. And you want to pick him up and hold him and, and hug him and protect him, and then you think, what a horrible disease. But I'd have to really scream. Scream like Mary Jane said one day, just scream in the shower. I'd have to beat on pillows. I would have to just lie on the floor and kick my heels and really get the pain and the hurt out of my body. I go to St. John's Hospital, Medical and Social Services calls me, and they say, here's an out-of-town mother. Well, I remember the first time this happened. I walked in, and here was this woman sitting in the car, about my age, from Canada. And she looked up, and she said, no one understands. I have a son, Michael, and he's dying of AIDS. And I just took her in my arms, and I said, I have a son, Michael, and he too is dying of AIDS. When you love your child, and you have to sit by and watch a disease like this, deteriorate the body that you gave birth to, to, you know, rob it, take it. It's just, it's just, uh, it's hard to accept. As a mother, it's hard to accept that you can't help your child. Yeah. You've got to have some place that you can scream, that you feel like screaming. Because most of the time, you have to hold in all your feelings. I can remember going to the hospital uh, and always getting bad news, taking my son along. I had no one to go with me. And uh, the day they told me that he had lost his sight in one eye and would be blind in the other within a very short time, 25 years old. And uh, I can remember wanting to cry. 
And I'm not even able to. And nobody, I couldn't even call anybody. How would they understand what I was feeling? My son is in God's hands right now. And I say, thank you, God, Jesus, thank you, God. Today's another day my son is alive. It could break any moment. My whole objective right now is to keep the hope alive in my son. Because hope is the only thing that's going to keep it. Once he accepts that he's dying, he's going to be gone. I know that. I hope that MAPS can provide a safe place for the mothers to express their emotions, their anger, all their feelings, anything that they can't express to someone else, they can do it here. I've had the problem of being a psychologist and working with AIDS patients, <coughs> as well as having a personal experience. My nephew, uh, Steve, is ill with AIDS, but I had been told by other professionals uh, don't tell anybody that you work with AIDS patients uh, or you don't have business. That's fine. Yeah. And I won't continue to be. The rejection. Oh, God, they didn't even want to work with me just because my nephew was sick. Girlfriend stopped calling and they stopped wanting to see me and all those jokes and hearing those jokes about all kinds of stuff and I really, I really shook me up. I can remember in the hospital when Mark was diagnosed and we were alone and he cried and I yelled him and he said, Mom, do you think I'm being punished by God because I'm homosexual? And I said, Mark, I don't I don't read anything in the Bible where it says except for homosexuals that come down with AIDS. I don't see that in there. When your son is dying, it does not matter what his lifestyle is or was. It does not matter. Dead is dead. You know, I heard from the very beginning when my son came to me at 18 and told me he was gay. I went crazy. I, I pulled out the Bible. I read scripture. I did all of these things. It finally, it took me about three, four months of being a banana and go, putting him through hell that I finally came to the realization that he was a gift from God. He was my son. Bottom line, I loved him. It didn't matter. I am so proud of my son, I cannot tell you. And I think every mother here is. They are going through the most horrendous, terrible things that we've ever probably faced in our lifetime. And they are doing it with such style. I've learned so much from him. I told him, I said, you know, mothers don't always keep strong. It's striking our young, uh, potentially great people, and it's annihilating, wiping them out. And it is not going to, it's not going to go away, and it's not going to stay in a in a target group that the rest of the community thinks it's going to stay in. It is here. The incubation period is five to seven years. Nobody can look you really in the eye and tell you that they're not going to have any tomorrow. Nobody. I'm no different than any other mother in the United States. It could happen to any of them at any time. And you see American mothers attacking a family with a child trying to get them back in school. And I wanted to scream out so bad, what are you doing? Tomorrow it could be you. If every congressman or senator had, had knew someone personally with AIDS, then I think that they would do something about it. But as it is, they don't have a personal stake in it and they don't really care. I want sisters and mothers and brothers, I want them to know that the AIDS patients are someone's brother and, and that they're not just somebody with AIDS. They're, some, they're a human being that needs, needs love and needs help and needs compassion. Sons, that was Peter's favorite time of day, and that's the time when he left us. I like to think of that year we had together, his last year, as very special. And I could watch him grow into a man at last, watch his courage and his stubborn, unending hope as he fought to live. And I learned from him. I learned about living and dying. I hope that mothers of AIDS patients everywhere will take advantage of this opportunity to be with their children. There are no second chances. 